This is Caroline from Caroline's Adventure. We all face challenges in our lives. How do some people take those challenges and turn them into powerful results? Join me as we dig into a story on resilience, hope, and joy, and uncover lessons we can each use in our own lives. But before we start, please take a moment to show that five-star rating button some love, and follow while you're there to be updated every time I release a new episode. Now, before we begin, a word of caution. On this podcast, we regularly discuss topics like sexual assault, suicide, and addiction, which may be disturbing to some. Please take care as you listen. And if you need support in the United States, reach out to the Crisis Text Line at 741-741. So everybody, this is my friend, Gay Brodick. And how long have we known each other? Like what, 10, 12 years, maybe? I was going to say between seven and 11. Okay. So somewhere in there. So we've known each other a long time. I'm I'm going to say that we have safely known each other probably at least a decade. And one of the cool things with Gabe is that he has in that time experienced some severe hardships. Um, you know, you, you were hospitalized with COVID, um, uh, kidney failure. You you've had some some real setbacks. But the cool thing that I know with you is that you are always focused on that path up. And so even when you have really, really just staggeringly bad news, you look at it and you're always like, okay, you know what? I'm going for my master's. I'm doing this next step forward. You're always pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and moving up. And I'd love to know more about that. Like, how did you develop that tenacity and that focus on going forward? And and how long have you had it? I don't know where it came from. I just know it's been there for a while. Um, I don't know if it was military, my parents, or a combination of both. I just um, I have, to, I have to find something to look forward to. Or you, um, my grandmother, and my grandfather have seven hundred million sayings. They used to always tell me it was all these little bitty um, antidotes or, or um, just uh run of the mill my grandmother was native and my grandfather was a character um i'll say it that way so <laughs> um there was there's been things that have been taught to me throughout my young life all the way into my adult life and and then i when you have kids you you have to reintroduce motivation into you him. Um, every time I felt like quitting, there's been a text message or a phone call or um, something that was like, you, you can't, there's too many things that you're not done with yet. Oh. And so um, it got to the point where I didn't need the phone call or the text message or um, that added push, it just became second nature. It's just like breathing. It's, um, I just um, got blessed. Yeah. And every time I get blessed, I try to enjoy that moment, but yet look forward to the next. So, yeah. The thing I find with blessings is that you have to be prepared to see them. And what I mean by that is that you have to be in a place where you're willing to accept that that's what that is. Because it's it's like if I say, okay, look around you and tell me some how many blue things do you see around you? Three. Three. Mm -hmm. okay. Now I want you to look around you. Don't see anything blue. Okay. Can you still, still see the blue things? Yeah, I still yeah. see them. Because I mean, you, I'm not supposed to, but... Because you're focused on seeing the blue. And no yeah. matter what you try not to see blue, you're going to see blue. Now, right. guess what? There's brown things around you as well. Mm -hmm. Look around you, how many brown things do you see? Multiple. Yes, but when we were Plenty. focused on the blue, you didn't see the brown. 
you, you were focused on the blue. And even when I said, don't look at blue, you still saw blue because your emphasis was on the blue. But once we said, okay, well, now we're going to shift to brown. You realize that there was all this other brown there. And it's the same thing with blessings where when you're choosing not to see blessings, they don't occur. But when you're in a mindset where you're like, you know what? I am blessed. I am fortunate. I am lucky. And I have something else to give this world. You're going to see signs because those signs are there to be seen. And they would have been there regardless. Mm -hmm. But because the lens that you are using to see them enables you to see them. No, you're, I, there's nothing that you said that I could disagree with. Um, and I don't want to. Yeah. Um, I I would even say um, for myself, I, I'll, I'll speak only about for myself. When I chose to mire in discomfort, pain, anguish, um, it became more prevalent. Yeah. It, it didn't matter, you know, it, it didn't matter that I was breathing. It was the fact that my back hurt. So that was all I cared about. Yeah. Or I'm in a cast because I broke my foot, yeah. you know. Uh, so you, you have to, um, a lot of people, me, I had to learn to accept the fact that, you know, there's a glass half empty, there's a glass half full, and then there's a glass just broke. Yes. You know, whether it's empty or half full, it, it there's a glass there. Yeah. You know, there's broken glass on the floor. That could be you. Yeah. And it's, the glass is always going to be half empty, half full, or broken, yeah. depending on how you look at it. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that I am learning in doing these interviews is that it is always a conscious choice. You know, I, I, I've talked with, I talked with a man who came through the foster care system and was sexually abused and, and physically abused and told he was nothing his entire childhood. And he now runs a nonprofit and is an inspirational speaker. Um, you know, I've, I've talked with people who've become through, who've come through such amazing hardships and the thing that enables them to take it to that next level is what you just said, the ability to look at the glass and be like, you know what? It doesn't matter what amount of liquid is in there or whether it's whole or not. I'm going to see it as half full and I'm going to see it as a, a sign that I am blessed and that I'm fortunate enough for there to be liquid in my world that I can drink and that will hydrate me because there are people out there that would love to have water. So yes, I absolutely. That. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, it's it's a mindset. Yes, it's absolutely a mindset. So here's a question, <clears throat> because the thing that I am learning, and I kind of had this sense before I started this process, um, but the so you, you could call this confirmation bias. I don't know, um, but what I'm finding is that you know I'm I'm talking with some super successful people. I mean you came through the military, you are very high up now in the financial sector, like you have come so incredibly far in life and done so much. And what I find is that it seems that everyone that I talk with that is really successful has come from so many struggles in life. And it isn't that they've had this like, you know, beautiful, easy path to it and like that life has just doors have opened to them and life has miraculously just bequeathed on them all of this amazing wonderfulness and they're riding around on unicorns and you know rainbows and and just start like <laughs> what yeah. i found in these interviews is that it is a case of um tenacity my my uh, last interview put it perfectly she said it is perseverance persistence and patience. And I love that because the patience piece is where I often forget, but it's all about that sticking with it through the tough times when it's easy, when it would be so easy just to be like, you know what? No, I'm done. This is too hard. You know, I'm going to step away from it all. It's just not worth it anymore. But having that, that persistence and that perseverance to see it through regardless, because you know in your heart that you're blessed and you're made for something better. Do you agree with that? Do you, 
what are your thoughts on that? I I absolutely agree with it. And um there's those are three, those are three pretty good ones. Um patience, perseverance, perseverance, yeah. Patience, uh perseverance, and what was the other one? Um persistence. Posturing. Persistence. I was gonna say posturing. Oh. Um, but um passion. Got to have passion too. Mm, passion's a good one too. Yeah. Um, because um in every career field I've ever uh whether I, I dove in completely or I just put my toe in it. Um the one thing about it was um finding something in the job that made the job more than just a job. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yeah. And you're right, the passion piece, the passion piece is so key because without that passion, it's real hard to persevere and have you know the persistence if you don't have the passion because if if you're not like intimately at a gut level connected with it in some way you're going to walk away when it gets hard yeah yeah no you um yeah there is it doesn't matter um i mean i yeah. culinary when i was in culinary you i used to um tell my guys cook love yeah um, and I had a guy that says, I don't love anything. And I said, didn't cook with hate. And he laughed. And I said, I said, do you hate anything? He says, I hate a lot of stuff. I said, then cook with it. I said, use it. He said, why? I said, love and hate is the same emotion. It's just how do you react to it? Yeah. I said, do you hate your job? He says, I hate it. I said, <laughs> I said show him how good you could be at it if you actually loved it. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. And, and it's true because like we've all eaten something that someone who cooks with love makes and it is insane mm -hmm. how much of a difference that makes you know yeah. like you can also my grandmother cooked with nothing but apathy and oh it was bad we had uh we all my sister my mother and i all got the flu one year and my grandmother made us chickens or i'm sorry vegetable soup and brings it and delivers it leaves it at the door she didn't come in and that stuff was horrible like when I say it was horrible, like we, as sick as we were, we were like, absolutely not. And so we had this lab and, and Ebony would eat anything. And when I say anything, like anything. So we tried to feed to Ebony, Ebony wouldn't touch it. And we were we like, to feed it to the dog. Oh my God. We we're like, we feel bad. So we put it out in the woods. We put, we put the pot out in the woods. Cause we we're like, okay, well, there's gotta be some wild creature. That's like, you know what? It's the middle of winter vegetable. That stuff sat there for months. It didn't rot. It didn't mildew. It didn't mold. It sat there. And but did she use the McDonald's recipe? I, I, I don't know what she did to it, but mm. like every single thing that woman cooked was made with apathy and you could taste it. Like it was, you, you didn't need her cooking. And so you are so right. When someone cooks with love or with, with passion, when they cook with passion, you taste it. And when they don't, then no one wants to taste it. Oh, you taste it once, but never <laughs> twice. No. Yeah. <laughs> I love that though, because you're right. The passion piece is huge. So here's a question. When you're working on something and the passion isn't there, what do you do? Whew. Push through, persevere. Push through, persevere, and try not to see it as punishment. Yeah. Um, I'm, my alliteration is pretty good today. Yeah, you are. But yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we're peeing a lot. Um, push through you. <laughs> you persevere. I, mean, I, I drink these like crazy, so I mean. Oh no, I have mine, but it's it's just in the corner, just in case. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, you have to. Um, I have. Um, I mean, I right now I'm doing audits, and um, because we don't have a budget, um, we're 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 we are shaking. I mean metaphorically and literally shaking the government we're shaking every account trying to see what falls out and um i just did a personal audit for someone because uh, they asked me to check it and so um long story short i found money for them and i told them don't spend it all immediately because the government will re-audit you because they don't like being wrong yeah um but that took three and a half months 
Okay, that that sounds like another P word, which is painful. That sounds painful. Um, yeah, they um, they are very painstakingly slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah That's its but i am but i am persistent oh <laughs> and always professional oh, see professional is perfunctory i mean really it, it, it's it's perchance if you happen to uh persist in the p words then i could profess to uh, i don't know some I, I I've got it. I, I've got it. If I had just a little bit more time, I would get it. But okay. it's there. <laughs> so have you always had this like focus on looking for the higher meaning and and, and looking for um the passion, or is it something that you had to develop over time? Oh, it was absolutely developed. Yeah. Um I don't know how deep you want to go with this, but bring it. Uh oh. Um, as a young male, there was very few things in life that I was passionate about. Um, played sports, pretty decent at most of them. Um, not the ones, but I didn't have the the drive or determination or um, I didn't I, I didn't want to commit the way my parents wanted me to commit. Um, because I saw it as an escape from reality and I understood that as long as I was doing certain things and I did them well, it allowed me to get away with other things. Um, those things were, uh, they were not illegal, but they were very, um, promiscuous in nature. Okay. I'll say that. Um, so uh being a young male as i said you men do things for three reasons um um because it'll make you popular it can get you paid or it can get you put it out there gabe uh, something that you use prophylactics to it'll, it'll get you laid yes um, so I, um, I, until I understood what I was doing, I was only doing it for two of the three reasons. I didn't care about popularity. <laughs> I wanted money and I wanted a girlfriend or what having a girlfriend includes. You want to um, hear? yes. I mean, why lie? Um, uh, and then. And amazingly enough, I this this might this might be horrible. Um, I saw the Cosby Show. Um, huh. Now we know it's twenty twenty four. We we know what happened. Yeah. Um, but the message was there's a different outlet. There's a different avenue. There's a different um, potential that one could have if education became a priority. Um, and so I was a, I was probably a B student in school. Um, I did just enough to get by. I didn't want people to know I was smart, but I had to be smart enough to stay eligible, mm -hmm. play sports. Mm -hmm. Because if you didn't play sports, you couldn't get girls. And if you couldn't get girls, you were riding the bus with, you know, 60 people. So um or more but um seeing a successful um when people say images matter uh presence matter um whether it's you know now with the the marvels with the three superhero ladies or the black panther or for myself the cosby show seeing something like that was it was powerful because it started to make me think like wow there's more than world than texas because when you're from Texas, you, it's, there's three things. It's God, football, and country. Now, depending on where you live at, it's football, God, and country. <laughs> or sometimes it's God, country, and football. But it's football, God, and country. There's three, there's all, that's it. 
If you're in Texas, that's all you live, you eat, you breathe, you sleep, you die. Football, God, and country. Now, you can mix that up however you want to. But if that isn't in your top three, you, you got problems. Um, so um, different avenues, different opportunities, different things can be seen and uh, realized. Just that TV show just was like, wow. I was like. I could be, I could be. A doctor. Black doctors, yeah. like, I'm gonna say something, and I, I'm, 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 I'm. This is me being sarcastic, cynical, and and yet a little bit, sadly, ser serious. Why we're friends? I told my we had to write a paper in school, and they said, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And I told my teacher, "I either wanted to be, um, <laughs> I either wanted to be the first successful." Uh, surgeon that separates Siamese twins, which ended up being Dr. Ben Carson, um, because I was trying to find something that black people hadn't done yet. Yeah. Or a serial killer. And she said, why? And I said, I just want to be the first black something. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, I'm going to call your mom. <laughs> please don't call my mother. If she has to take off work, I'm going to die. Like, please. And she said, I'm going to call your father. And I said, yes, but please don't call my mother because my dad, I can have a conversation with him. No, no. Mom didn't play with education. And so um, it's probably the biggest reason I didn't go to college directly out of school because I was so burned out on it. And so um, interesting. So tired of being held to a standard that I didn't know how to achieve. Yeah. It's like. I'm a B student. Well, you could be an A student. Your brother's an A student. Yeah. No, you can't beat me up. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't your passion. It wasn't your, mm. yeah, it wasn't your motivation. No, I just wanted to play football, chase girls, and get a water burger on, on the weekend. Um, and then uh, Jordans came out, and I wanted a pair of Jordans and chase girls and get a water burger on the weekend. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's um, four things that guys want. Because you, you said it was three, but but Jordans now are, are four. No, so Jordans fall under money. You gotta get paid to get Jordans. And if you don't get paid, can the date to get a girl. So it money <laughs> money is the root of all evil, but that tree has to grow, or you can't get two of those three things. <laughs> gotcha. So, gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So what changed then? Because as I mentioned earlier, you've got your master's now, like, you know, you are always in school for something. I it, it, it seems like every time, you know, you and I talk, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going back for school for this or that or that. So like what changed? You know, 22 years in the military, people don't believe it. It flies by. It's, it's a burp and a sneeze and a fart and a cough in your, and it's 20 years. It's, I mean, it's not to be vulgar. It's just, you don't realize how fast yeah. 20 years is. And especially when you're always moving every three years, every three years are changing locations, you're changing scenery, you're changing, uh, yeah, it, it's- that, that makes sense. Cause you're right. When you're moving, you're constantly learning something new. Mm -hmm. you're place you're getting settled and then you pick up again and it makes sense that it would go really quickly because you're constantly mm -hmm. uh, yeah as the old saying goes moss doesn't collect on a rolling rock nope and you're somewhere three years the first year you're you're learning the first year is all you um i i used to always tell my guys you're your first year here you're a sponge I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to fill you up with as much liquid as I can until it starts oozing out of you. And they would look at me and they would say, <laughs> whatever the kids say now, the pauses and all that stuff. And I'm like, huh? Because I'm old. I don't know what that stuff is. But I'm like, okay, pause, whatever that means. You know. <laughs> yeah, but I'm gonna my job is to is to fill you up with as much as possible. And if you can't take it. We'll, we'll figure out how to get it back in you. And they would be like, yo, you got to stop. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, stop what? And then 
Uh, and then I was like, oh man, that's, man, that's, that's kind of bad. I should probably work on that. Yeah. Um, so I would, um, I would literally um, like find one or two people. And I went from saying sponges to um, uh, like computers. And I, I would tell them, I'm gonna download everything I can into you. And I was like, that sounds less threatening or sexual. And they were like, yeah, okay. I was like, so you're my, you're my USB and I'm gonna download everything I can into you. And your job is in 10 years from now, find someone to download all of the stuff that I taught you and the stuff that you learned and the stuff that you improved on into the next person. Um, and so that first year you're just learning. The second year you're, you're, um, you're, you're not, a, you're not a journeyman anymore. You're becoming the, um, not quite the SME, the subject matter expert, but you're becoming the guy that, that can, tweak and learn and move stuff and you don't know where to go you get it from the person that knows and then you can do all that stuff and then the third year you're the SME you're the subject matter expert and you're like the guy they come to to get everything done and all this other stuff and then the fourth year you're gone wow. and it starts all over again wow and so people are like how do you and if you if you can't retain the information um which no one retains 100 percent of everything yeah but my whole thing was my third year, I was looking to find somebody to data dump all mm -hmm. of the stuff that I learned into. And each person I found at different places, I found one or two that were receptive and I found many that didn't want anything to do with it. And I was like, I'm not going to waste my energy trying to force something on you. Yeah. And I get to look back and see those guys now and they're, as they're, they're climbing in their careers and they'll, they'll text me, hey man, I just got promoted. You know, and I'm just like you. I was hard, but I'm fair. And every once in a while, I make a bad joke, and I make sure to see who laughs. And I'm like, stop being a kiss ass because that was a bad joke. Um, stuff, yeah. stuff like that, because you know, you know, make like a tree and leave. That's not funny. <laughs> it's not. Why are you laughing? You're stop five. brown nosing. If you're five, then then that's that's great. That's that's yeah, but, no. but no, you're right. It's not funny. I'm not going to make you number one because you laughed at my jokes. No, I'm going to make you number one because you you perform. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I you go to Bremerton, I go to Virginia, I go to Washington State, I go to San Diego, I go to New Orleans, and I spend eight years in Dubai, Bahrain. Twenty three years gone. Wow. Twenty two years is over. It's like. And then people say that the first question they asked me when I was in high school, it comes back. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> oh, no, I joined the military. Yeah, it's over. Now what? So I went back to school. And I got my master's. Well, I got my bachelor's in, I got my BS. Is it BS? Yeah, got my bachelor's in science in business. And I got a BS in business and a BS in math. And then I got a MBA with a HR and then I got my second mathematics, master's in math, master's in statistical analysts and mathematic principles. Some crap. I don't know. Whatever. That's, I, be proud if I you. get a doctorate in it, I'll be a math teacher. I don't want to be a math teacher. Oh. I don't want to deal with these kids. So what do you want to be next? I used to dream about two things. Dream about being rich and famous. I want neither. Yeah. I want I want peace. Yes. And I want freedom of movement. Yeah. That's all I want. I want to be able to go places, see things, enjoy the little time I have left on this earth with people I love. Um and make good memories. That's huge. And that's that right there is such a, a powerful realization because I don't think life really starts until you stop chasing the other stuff, you know, the, the wealth, the fame, the whatever, like when you are living purchase to purchase and, and like constantly looking for, okay, you know, I, I, I came from abject poverty. 
and lived in a four four room. And when I say four room, I mean four room um, shack that was dug into the side of the mountain that didn't have running water or electricity. We ran an extension cord off of the neighbor's uh, power line. And when it rained, <laughs> we would have to unplug it because you didn't want it to, to zap. And so like- Did you we, have a tin roof? We did have a tin roof. Me too. And, and we uh, did you have an outhouse? Oh my God. My grandmother's house had an outhouse. Um, my grandmother's on my dad's side. We had, a, they had an outhouse. They were, um, they lived in farm country. Yep. Um, you didn't go to the bathroom after the lights went out. Uh, well, Cause you had no idea what would be out there. That and in the winter, my, my sister was little, she was like three or four and she couldn't quite reach it well. And so she would pee on the seat and it would freeze. And you would go and you would know the moment you sat down. Slid. Oh, or you get stuck in it. But you would sit on it and it would melt and you'd be like, and we didn't always have toilet paper. So you're like, when I get up from this, there and there's no there's nowhere to wash hands. There's nowhere like no. Oh, no. oh I hated it. I hated yeah, that. We had a uh, we had a hose. Oh. I remember having a hose. Um a friend of mine, I have a friend of mine, his name is uh, Nakia. Um, I have a friend of mine, his name is Sean. And another friend of mine, his name is Jason. Now, myself and Nakia, we're Black. Sean and Jason are white. We were having a conversation talking about our high school reunion. They're like, are you coming to the reunion? I was like, man, I'm not going back to Texas. Oh, you got to come. You got to come. You got to come. Jason goes, hey, man, do you remember we went on this trip? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, no, I don't remember that. He was like, we were, he says, we were picking cotton. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, everything, we, they gave us these burlap bags. And we were talking, we were texting in the chat. Oh. And my friend Nakia goes, wait a minute. You didn't pick cotton? He goes, no, we got to pay. So there was two tiers. There was the people who you paid a separate price. If you paid 20 or $30, you didn't have to pick cotton. You were an overseer and you got to manage oh. the people picking cotton. So we found out in our group of four, we're, we're all still friends. Like we still, we send each other the worst stuff possible on the internet. We do. It's, dude, what those did you friends. send me? Those like, are good friends. I'm like, it's a German commercial for Skittles. You're going to love it. <laughs> um, taste the rainbow, for real. Now, now um, I Google German commercial for Skittles. Like I, I, I need I to know. I could probably send it to you, but um, I literally realized we picked cotton, myself, Nakia, and Sean. Jason had enough money. He didn't have to pick cotton. He was our manager. And he got to wear a hat oh. and stand behind us while we picked cotton. We He had a picture of it. He yeah. posted the picture, yes, and he posted it, and I couldn't screenshot it because it was so grainy. I asked him to send me a copy. He won't send it. He said his mom was embarrassed by it. She won't let him have the picture. But it was one of those things where I was like, oh, my God. They put us in overalls and we were picking. Oh. I swear to you, it's the oh my. it is the worst and funniest thing. And it's a memory that I did not have until we started talking about it. And then it like light. It hit me. And I was like, oh, my God, I remember that. Oh. And I was like, we were supposed to go to the zoo that day, but they had an animal that attacked somebody like the week prior. So they changed it to this museum and we got to pick cotton. And I went home and told my mom and I asked my mom about it recently. And she was like, I remember that. Oh, wow. And I was like, that's true. She was like, yeah, they did it until like a few years ago. I was oh. like, what? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't know how we got here and I apologize, but yeah, that just, I, yeah. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm, I'm all about this. That is, that is wild. Yeah. I'm going to say this is my sound weird. I have very little respect for money, mm -hmm. but I respect time more than anything. In the world. I can yeah. always make more money. I can yeah. make more money. I'll work harder. I'll, I'll get another job. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not going to waste my money frivolously. I'm not going to blow it and I'm not going to do stupid things. I do have bad habits. You know, I am rebounding. I am rebuying my childhood sneaker collection that I couldn't afford when um, I was a child and I had gotten to the point of no return. And now I don't know what to do with these shoes. 
Um, maybe there'll be great hand-me-downs, but um, uh, time, time is running out. The hourglass, I don't know how much time I have left in it or how much sand I have in it, but I need to go home and hug some people at least one more time. So I will, I will do that. Wow. Me too. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a good reminder. You know, it is. I can stomach, I could stomach Texas long enough to go kiss and hug my, my family. Yeah. And I don't hate Texas. I just hate what Texas brings out of me. Yeah. So. That's good though. I mean, it's, it's good to, yeah, I, I don't, I don't talk to my mother and, um, I wonder sometimes it, I didn't have a relationship with my father. And when he passed, I went to see him on his, on his deathbed. And it was, it was hard. It, you know, I, I hadn't had a relationship with him in a long time and he had, he had a severe head injury when I was, I think, I want to say I was 11, 10 or 11. Um, and so we hadn't had a, a relationship for a long time. And I take that back. It was, I was 13. I was 13 when he had his accident. Um, but my father was abusive and controlling before the accident. But after the accident, he became more, more distilled in the, in that piece. And like, you know, in college, he loved to call at about 3 AM and tell me about the animals he had killed. And I'm vegan now. It took me a long time to realize that a big part of why I went vegetarian and then vegan was that I had been around when he killed animals. He killed animals very consistently and very, um, very frequently. You know, he he wouldn't fix, he wouldn't get his dogs spayed and then they would get pregnant and they would have errant litters of puppies and he would wait until the puppies opened their eyes and became mobile. And then he would teach them to swim and did this very consistently. Or he would give them hard head therapy with a, a hammer. And, um, you know, I, I've either seen or heard about more animals dying than I ever, than I ever would, would wish on anybody. Um, I know what sound rabbits make when they're, when they're being skinned and, you know, it's, you, you can't forget that. You, you can't forget that sound. So I, it played a big role in why I went vegetarian. And then once I realized how um, detrimental the, the meat, you know, how cruel the meat and or the dairy and egg industries are, um, I, I let those go as well because I didn't want to be tied to anything else suffering and um that's powerful yeah it but it i don't even know what got me down this path um well, you're fine that's when you when you saw him mm. when you saw him before he went did it did it give you closure you know what it did give me um I had an opportunity to, to ask him and it was a question that I'd had for a long time because he, he abused me my whole childhood um, up until we left when I was 10. And um, I had a chance to ask him, I said, you know, did you ever want to be a, you know, my father? And here he is, you know, weak on his deathbed, severe head injury patient. So he didn't have many lucid moments, but he had one of those just fleeting lucid moments and he thought for a moment I thought he wasn't going to answer and then he said you know Caroline I never had a choice your mother stopped taking her birth control and didn't tell me and I didn't get the choice of whether or not to be your father and in the moment it was like a gut punch but it was also it, it reaffirmed things that I had known at a gut level, I always felt unwanted. Um, and, yeah. And it was like, it, and it was freeing because my entire life, I had always thought, okay, 
if I am successful enough, they will love me. If I do my makeup well, they will love me. If I'm really, really um, driven and get the perfect car, they will love me. If I have a luxury house, they will love me. If I am accomplished and I get my degrees and if I do all of these things, I will be worthy of their love. And it was hard to hear, but it was also amazingly freeing to realize that it was never about me. Mm -hmm. I, I could have been, I could have been anything and it never would have been enough to earn their love and to be mm -hmm. loved the way, you know, unconditionally that mm -hmm. a child deserves to be loved. Right. And so without parameters, without, it, yes, yeah. uh, holy and for who I am. And just because I'm their child and I deserve to be loved. And so it was incredibly freeing. It was hard. And I realized um, when he did pass, I mourned much harder than I had thought I would. Like I, we hadn't had a relationship for years. I mourned him when he had his accident because the man that I knew died. And so I didn't really think that there was much there for me to mourn. But when he did die, I mourned hard for about a year. And what I realized was the thing I lost then even though there was no chance of us ever developing a relationship and no, you know, from his head injury, he was so far gone that there wasn't a him there to have a relationship with, but I lost the potential other, uh, uh, the unrealistic, but still lingering potential that it could be something different. Possibility. Yeah. And so when my, you know, like when my mother is getting older and I, I wonder with her sometimes I'm like, I, told her when we, when I broke off contact that like the door was open, but we had to work in therapy to get to a healthier place. Hmm. And she told me at the time that that was too much effort and she didn't want to be bothered. And I said, okay, I, you know, that hurts, but I respect that. But I do wonder, you know, if I get that call at some point, because she's chosen not to meet me halfway, um, I wonder how it will feel. So I applaud you doing the hard thing and going down there and, and facing that and, and having the gumption. It's, it's just a different aspect. I, I see it that way. I was, um, I, I was watching a, a podcast uh, actually earlier today and they were talking about how the part of our brain that gets exercised anytime you do something you don't want to do grows larger so when you force yourself to do anything it can be eat a salad it can be work out it can be pick up that phone and do that call that you do you don't want to be out with whatever it is anytime you force yourself to do something that you don't want to do it grows the part of the brain that leads to longevity and so they have found that people that live longer have a larger part of that brain and and they're trying to determine whether the correlation is that because people work out regularly, they live longer, or if it's people that work out regularly, force themselves to do it and they don't, and, and because it's a daily forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do, that part of their brain gets larger and so they live longer. And they're, hmm. they're, they're trying to determine what that correlation is, but there's definitely a distinct tie between that portion of the brain being large and living longer. And so are those, are those people more likely to develop um, dementia or all, Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's? They didn't, they didn't tie into that. But what I have read is that um, people that find new ways to challenge their brain. So walking backwards or walking with your eyes closed or walking sideways or doing things like that, that, that change the connectivity of how you move your physical movement and doing it in some new way does help to increase your brain health and to put off things like Alzheimer's or dementia. Hmm. So, so if you force yourself to walk backwards every day, then that, then that's all of it. That's all good. I do pretty much a lot of forcing myself to do things. <laughs> You're like my whole damn life is forcing myself. <laughs> Well, thank you for this. This was awesome.
Thank you. It was a pleasure. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'm glad that it wasn't too painful. Nah, I was, I was actually, I've, I've been actually looking forward to it all week. And then last week was, last week was bad. Um, but no, thank you for being patient. And thank you. This is fun. I'm glad. Um, and if you realize you only have about 14 minutes worth of usable footage and we got to do it again, just, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Caroline's Adventure Podcast. While you're here, subscribe to the show so you're the first to catch new episodes when they're released. And if you enjoyed hanging out with me today, please leave a five-star rating. For links to social media and more content, visit the description for this episode or go to carolinesadventure.com. That's Caroline with two A's, Adventure. Dot com. Cool. Bye. Bye. Hmm.